This is Concepti Classes and today we will deal with part 2 of chapter 7 and class 9 science diversity in living organisms. So in part 1 first we discussed what is the basis of classification some of the characteristics which are considered for classifying living organisms like if they have a nucleus or not whether they are unicellular or multicellular etc. Then we studied about classification and what is evolution. Then we saw the hierarchy of classification, that is the groups like kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. Then we understood all living organisms are divided into kingdoms, namely Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae and Animalia. And in part 1 we saw till Plantae, in part 2 first we will see Animalia, then about nomenclature. So let's start. So what is the classification made by Whittaker? He classified all these living organisms on the major characteristics like whether they have a nucleus or not, whether they have a cell wall, whether these cells are unicellular or multicellular, autotrophs or heterotrophs. So based on all this, he classified all these living organisms into five kingdoms, namely Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae and Animalia. So we have already studied till Plantae. So let's see Animalia. Now in kingdom animalia, the organisms are multicellular, they are eukaryotes, that is they have a nucleus, but they do not have cell walls. They are heterotrophs. Heterotrophs means they depend on other organisms for food. Most animals are mobile, that is they can move. Now this kingdom animalia further classified on the type of body differentiation. Okay, so let's see the further classification of kingdom animalia. So kingdom animalia is further classified into porifera, Cylindrata, Platyhelminthus, Nematoda, Annelida, Arthropoda, Mollusca, Echinodermata, Protochordata and Vertebrata. So let's study each of these divisions briefly. So the first division that comes under the kingdom Animalia is Porifera. Now the word Porifera means organisms with holes. See these organisms? These are non-motile animals attached to some solid support that is they cannot move and they are attached to the solid support and this consists of many small spicules. The spicules are the components or the structural elements found in most of these organisms and this makes these organisms body very rigid. Now there are holes or pores all over this body see like this and these pores actually lead to the canal system that helps in circulating water throughout the body to bring in food and oxygen. These animals are covered with a hard outside layer or a skeleton. See, they're very hard. Now, the body design, they don't have much uh, differentiation or division in tissues. And these are commonly called as sponges and they are mostly found in marine habitats in water. Some examples are Euplectella, Sycon and Spongilla. And the next division is Cylindrata. Now these are the animals living in water. Their body design shows much more differentiation compared to the Porifera. Now there is a cavity in the body. See like this. And the body is made up of two layers of cell. One cell makes up the cells on the outside whereas the other makes the inner lining of the cell and in, see inside we have the cavity. Now some of the species lives in colonies like corals while others have a solitary lifespan like hydra, they live alone. Jellyfish and sea animals are the common example of cylindrates. Next division is Platyhelminthus. Now the body design of the animals in this group is more complex compared to Porifera and Cylindrata. The body is bilaterally symmetrical. Now what do you mean by bilaterally symmetrical? It means that if we divide this body into two parts, the left and the right halves of the body would have the same design. So such organisms are said to be bilateral symmetrical. They are also triploblastic. Now what do you mean by triploblastic? It means that the organisms which have three layers of cell from which differentiated tissues can be made are called as triploblastic that is the organisms which have three germ layers endoderm the middle layer is mesoderm the outermost layer is ectoderm 
these uh, germ layers are the three primary cell layers uh, which are found in the earliest stages of embryonic development and these germ layers actually give rise to all the cells and tissues in the body they help in uh, the body linings as well as in the formation of organs so we can say that there is some degree of tissue formation in these organisms but there is no true internal body cavity or coelom they have no cavity inside their body now the body is flattened dorso ventrically which means if you take from top to bottom the body is flattened that is why we call these animals as flatworms now they are either free living or parasitic we have already explained parasitic in part 1 if you have doubts please refer that slide some examples are planarians which are free living animals or liver flukes which are parasitic animals the fourth division is nematode the nematode body is also bilaterally symmetrical that is if you divide this body into two halves the left and the right half would be the same they are also triploblastic that is if you take a section out of this we can see three germless and hence they are called as triploblastic their body is cylindrical as see you can see in the figure there are tissues but they have no real organs and there is a sort of body cavity there is some type of cavity and it's called as pseudo colon they are actually parasitic worms which cause many diseases like the filarial worms which causes elephantiasis or the worms which we can see in the intestine called as round worms or pin worms some other examples of nematode are ascaris and bucheria next division is annelida now annelid animals are also bilateral symmetrical they are triploblastic as well that is if we divide this into two the left and the right half of the organism would be the same so they are bilateral symmetrical they also have three layers endoderm ectoderm and mesoderm so they are also called as triploblastic they have a true body cavity they have a cavity thus they have extensive organ differentiation now this differentiation occurs in a segmental fashion with segments lined up from the head to the tail that is if we observe this organisms the body is divided into many ring like segments from the head to the toe so that is why these organisms are called as annelids these animals are found in variety of habitats like fresh water marine water as well as land and some of the examples of annelids are earthworms and leeches now the sixth division that comes under kingdom animalia is arthropoda now this is probably the largest group of animals these animals are also bilateral symmetrical and they are segmented as well now there is an open circulatory system what do you mean by open circulatory system it means that there have no vessels to contain the blood the blood flows freely through the cavities in the body and thus we can say that the coelomic cavity is blood filled okay they have joint legs that's why they are called as arthropod arthropod means jointed legs okay and some examples are prawns butterflies house flies spiders scorpions and crabs division is mollusca now the animals in this group they are also bilateral symmetrical the coelomic cavity is reduced see only this much is the coelom there is a very little segmentation they also have an open circulatory system and kidney like organs for excretion okay and these all are the organs that can be found under the organisms which can under this division and in some mollusk uh, they have a hard shell which covers the soft body which is made up of calcium carbonate and there is also food that is used for moving around the most common examples of mollusk are snails and now the eighth division that comes under kingdom animalia is echinodermata in greek echinos means hedgehog it's a spiny type of animal and derma means skin so these organisms are called as spiny skin organisms so if you observe this organisms we can see see they have spines over the body so these organisms are called as spiny skinned organism these are exclusively free living marine animals we can see these organisms only in water now they are triploblastic 
and they have a coelomic cavity they also have peculiar water driven tube system that is used for moving see this type of tubes are there inside these body so that they could move around with this now they have a hard calcium carbonate structure that they use as a skeleton that is they have a skeleton which is made of a calcium carbonate and some of the examples of echinoderminata are sea stars sea urchin etc next division is protochordata now the animals here also are bilateral symmetrical they are triploblastic and they have a coelom but they show a new feature of body design namely called as a notochord now what is a notochord it is a long rod like support structure see this one this pink color see that runs along the back of an animal it's found in the back of the animal it separates the nervous tissue from the gut okay so this is actually a string or a cord that runs in the back of an animal which separates the nervous tissue from the gut and it provides a place for the muscles to attach for ease of the movement protochordates may not have a proper protochord present at all stages in their lives or for the entire length of the animal and these protochordates are marine animals examples are balanoglossus herd mania and ampicius the last division that comes under kingdom animalia is vertebrata now these animals have a true vertebral column and an internal skeleton vertebrates are bilaterally symmetrical okay they are triploblastic they are coelomic and segmented they have a complex differentiation of body tissues and organs they have a lot of organs because of the different differentiation of tissues and all chordates they possess the following features let's see what all are the features they have a notochord they have a dorsal nerve cord see this blue color one see a nerve cord is there other than the notochord they are triploblastic they have paired gill pouches and they are coelomate that is they have a coelom so the vertebrata are grouped into six classes they are cyclostomata pieces amphibia reptilia aves and mammalia so let's see each of these classes briefly so the first class that comes under vertebrata is cyclostomata cyclostomes are jawless vertebrates the main characteristics of these organisms is that they have a long elongated body like an eel and they have a circular mouth they have very slimy skin and they do not have scales like a fish they are scaleless okay and they are ectoparasites or borers of other vertebrates that means uh, ectoparasites are the parasites that live on the outside of the host okay the main examples of cyclostomes are petromyzon which is also called as lamprey and hagfish next class is pieces all the fishes they come under this class they are exclusively aquatic animals the skin is covered with scales or plates they obtain oxygen which is dissolved in the water by using gills now about their body it is streamlined see this is streamlined and they have a muscular tail which is used for movement they are cold blooded animals and their hearts have only two chambers they lay eggs now some fish they have skeletons which is entirely made of cartilage such as sharks and some fishes like tuna and rohu they have a skeleton which is made up of both bone and cartilage so all fishes they come under this class the third class that comes under vertebrata is amphibia now these animals they differ from the fish in lack of scales but they have a mucus glands in their skin so these organisms they do not have scales but they have mucus glands on their skin they have a three chambered heart in the case of fishes there were only two chambers but in amphibia there are three chambers the respiration is through either gills or sometimes through lungs they lay eggs these animals are found both in water and on land that is why they are called as amphibia that means double life they can live both in water as well as land some common examples are frogs toads and salamanders 
Now the next class which comes under vertebrata is reptilia. These animals are cold-blooded animals and they have scales. They breathe through the lungs. Most of them have a three-chambered heart but crocodiles they have four heart chambers. They lay eggs with tough coverings and they do not need to lay the eggs in water like amphibious. Some examples are snakes, turtles, lizards and crocodiles. Next class is Aves. These are warm-blooded animals. They have a four-chambered heart. They lay eggs and there is an outside covering of feathers and they have two forelimbs which we call as wings for flying. They breathe through their lungs and all the birds they fall in this category. So the last class which comes under vertebrata is mammalia. Mammals are warm-blooded animals with a four-chambered hearts. They have mammary glands for the production of milk to nourish the young ones. The skin has hair as well as they have sweat glands and oil glands. Most mammals they produce live young ones. However, some of the mammals like platypus and echinida they lay eggs. Some examples of mammals are cat, humans, uh, elephants, giraffes, whale, etc. So that's all about kingdom Animalia. Now let's see what is nomenclature. Nomenclature is a system of naming organisms. We know that there is a variety of languages in the whole world and it would be difficult for people speaking in different languages to know when they are talking about the same organism. So this problem was solved by agreeing upon a scientific name. Just like how we write chemical symbols and formulas for various substances, a scientific name was given to an organism which was unique and can be used to identify it anywhere in the world. So this system of scientific naming or nomenclature was introduced by Carlos Linnaeus in the 18th century. The scientific name of an organism is the result of the process of classification. We have already studied classification, right? First we have a kingdom, then we have phylum, class, order, family. So there is no need to list out the whole hierarchy or group. Uh, which an organism belong. Instead, we limit ourselves in writing the name of the genus and species of a particular organism. Okay, so let's say an example like a crab. The common name is pebble crab, but we only use the genus and the species name. Here the genus name is Santhias and the species name is Lamarki. Okay, so in a scientific name or in a binomial nomenclature, Two words are used, a generic name and a specific name, which is a species name. Now, there are certain conventions to be followed while writing the scientific name. So, we know that scientific name consists of two parts. The first name is the generic name, that is the name of the genus. It begins with a capital letter. The second name is the species name, the name of the species. It begins with a small letter. Now, when we are printing the scientific name, the scientific name is given in italics. See, here, for the in the case of cat, the scientific name is Felis catus. See, human, Homo sapiens. The genus is always starts with a capital letter and the species name. The name of the species is always in small letter. And when we write by hand, the genus name and the species name have to be underlined separately. So that's all for chapter 7, Diversity in Living Organisms. Tune in soon for the next session. Thank you so much. May God bless you all. Stay safe, take care and bye-bye.